It is 5.30 p.m. I will call the October 12th. <laughs> Boy, I will really call the meeting to order. The first we'll have a moment of silence and then say the Pledge of Allegiance. first part is what is wrong with this <laughs> the first part is what we enjoy very much doing uh, some presentations recognitions awards and announcements dr. Warren team we have a very special guest with us tonight for you guys she's not a guest for us she's one of us she's a, she's one of our teammates but I wanted to introduce you to, to uh, one of uh, Joanna's uh, member of her team who is doing an incredible job for us. And so Joanna, come to the come to the front. Sung Sung, come up, please. Yes, ma'am, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna, introduce. Uh, Nadam Mao, and that's how are you? Um, and Narat Kailam, thank you for coming to our meeting. Narat Kailam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Noong Ne Sung. We all know her as Sung Sung. Her nickname is Sung Sung. She is our uh, parent liaison for our department for our Burmese families. And in getting to know Sung Sung, I knew that we were making the right hire, but I, I, getting to know her even more has been tremendous. She started out with only working at Rusk and Lee High School. Our Burmese families have um, moved out of the areas, and she now works at 15 different campuses. And so she helps us also with the pre-K department, the SPED department, and student services. Um, she translates for us at the campus level with students, with teachers, administrators. And um, just now she showed me a PowerPoint that she's trying to translate for a campus so that they can have a parent meeting with the Burmese population. She's doing a phenomenal job. She's got with her today Cole Leon Boy, who is her husband. Mm. And Nile Parr is her sister. Mm -hmm. And Regan Hu, who is a second grader with us in our district, um, he's not here today. And Emmanuel is a kindergartner with us, and they both go to Rusk. <coughs> and I asked her why she didn't bring them, and they're taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sung Sung has come to us uh, through way of Malaysia from Burma. And she has actually been in Midland six years now. Um, she is on Rosetta Stone, trying to make her English a lot better. But she speaks English, Hakka, Burmese, Mitsu, and Falam. So she truly helps with the Burmese population and able to translate to many different of their languages. She is also the pastor of her church at Midland Chin Baptist Church. So, so That's even better, she's a Baptist. Uh. <laughs> Um, Sung Sung, we, we want to make sure you understand how much we appreciate everything that you do. Um, board, you know it's an incredibly um, high-pressure job being a part of our bilingual and ESL department. All, all of our staff, all of Joanna's staff do an incredible job uh, dealing with the, the pressures of, of serving our children. Um, you know, Sung Sung coming to our country and uh, then coming to Midland and really making it our home and then what we think is just going above and beyond the call of duty uh, with what she's doing for, for our children, for, for both her two children, but for all of our children. And, and soon, soon, we, we have an award that we give people that we feel just do above and beyond the call of duty. And what we're, we are calling you this month's Hero for Kids. And we appreciate everything that you do. What a hero is. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's you. 
That's exactly Thank what I so said. Much. It's what you do for our kids and for us. Let's get a picture. And I'm going to tell the board, um, when I had to translate what superintendent meant, we couldn't get the translation across just right, and so they call Dr. Warren Big Daddy. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Sing Sing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, now we get to do something uh, equally as, uh, as great as we're going to recognize some students. And Mr. Horner, come in. One of the, uh, the most important thing we do is our academic program. And we have some students who have gone truly uh, above and beyond the call of duty in their academic endeavors. So we're very proud to recognize them and bring them to you this evening. Board. Jeffrey? Dr. Warren, we're going to uh, bring up Judy Bridges, our Director of Advanced Academic Services. She's going to say just a little bit about the awards and what they are, and okay. then we'll go to Lee High School and then Midland High School. Great. Hi, Judy. Hi. How are you? Good. Thank you for recognizing these students this evening. They are, many of them are near, near and dear to my heart because they were Carver students mm -hmm. at one time, and now they're part of our Advanced Academic Services. Mm -hmm. Tonight, we plan to recognize our AP Scholars AP Scholars with Honor, National Hispanic, uh, National Merit Recognition Program, excuse me, National Merit Letters of Commendation, and the National Merit Semifinalist. And sometimes it's difficult in the introducing them to tell you how they qualified because that's my job to do it quickly because they're more important. Um, the AP Scholar Award is granted to students who receive scores of three or higher on three or more AP exams. An AP Scholar with Honors is granted to students who have an average score of at least 3.25 on all AP exams taken and scores of three or higher on four or more exams. And that is really quite a feat. The next group is the National Merit Recognition Program, and it requires a score or a selection index on the PSAT of 182 and a GPA of 3.5 and be at least one quarter Hispanic Latino. The National Merit Letters of Commended or the Commended Scholars, as they're often called, require a particular score in their state of at least, well, excuse me, it's a national uh, score of 202 for the commended scholars. And that has risen and, and falls depending on the scores of the students in the particular PSAT. And finally, the National Merit Semifinalists are picked based on their uh, score in the state of Texas. And it varies from state to state and year to year. This year, Texas was the fifth highest score in the nation. And so we have a student who is a National Merit Finalist and they had to have a 220, which is the highest it's been in quite a while. It is my pleasure to introduce the principals of, this school, of our schools. First, Mr. Stan Van Hooser will introduce the Lee High School Award winners. Thank you, Judy. It's always a pleasure and an honor to get to recognize our students for our academic awards. Uh, it's one of the things we really enjoy doing at school. So uh, I'd like to introduce these students. We're going to start first with the, Acapic, at the AP Scholars. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, our first student is Davis Baker. David, come on up. Don't be shy. So. Davis is the son of David and Misty Baker. He plans on attending Texas A&M University and plans on majoring in petroleum engineering. So, Davis Baker, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Next is Matthew Fox. He's the son of Whitney, Whitney Fox and Elizabeth Jimenez. 
Merci. He plans on attending that other school in Texas, uh, UT, and majoring in international business. Next AP scholar is Thomas Rubio. He's the son of Abner and Mildred Rubio. Thomas is still undecided on which university he plans to attend, but he does plan on majoring in pre-med and biology. So, Thomas. Next is Kyle Stratton. He's the son of Wayne and Suzanne Stratton. Kyle plans to attend either Baylor or Colorado School of Mines, and he plans on studying mechanical and metallurgical engineering. <laughs> I had to learn how to say that this week. <laughs> Next is our National H Hispanic Recognition Award, and that goes to Miranda Martinez. She's the daughter of Mark and Gosha Mar Martinez. She's planning on attending either Rice or Baylor University, and she wants to major in biology and minor in biochemistry and go to med school. <laughs> Next are our National Merit Commended students. Uh, first, we have Hunter Coleman, and Hunter is also an AP Scholar with Honors, as well as a National Merit Commended. He's the son of David and Terry Coleman. He plans on attending Texas A&M University and majoring in mechanical engineering. <laughs> Next, we have Sh Sean Okimi. She's the daughter of Titi Lyo Okimi. <laughs> Sean. She's, an eight, she's a National Merit Commended uh, student and she plans on attending Rice University and majoring in pre-med. <laughs> Next we have Claire Smith. She's also a National Merit Commended student. Claire is the daughter of Lance and Sherry Smith. Excuse me. She plans on attending uh, Texas Tech University and majoring in English. Yes. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, she's an AP scholar and a National Merit semifinalist, Alexis Mamalidis. Alex Excuse me, Alexa. Um, Alexa, sorry. <laughs> I'll get it right one of these days. Uh, she's the daughter of Mitch and Barbara Mamalidis. She's yet undecided on which college she plans to attend, but she plans on majoring in linguistics and minoring in dance. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Right, right up here. Say, Tommy. Good evening. Thank you uh, again, Dr. Warren and board, for allowing us to do this. This is one of the, the highlights of the year is to be able to introduce these, these students who are performing so well at our school. Uh, I want to introduce, uh, to, to begin, I want to be, begin with Eric Brandon Cam. He is a National Merit Commended Scholar and AP Scholar. Yeah. 
Eric is the son of, wait, face the crowd. <laughs> Eric is the son of Chan and Marlena Cam. He is graduating, he plans to graduate with degrees in engineering business, working his way up the ladder, starting his own nonprofit, and planning funding for the construction of new schools and libraries. Yay! Eric Cam. <laughs> Next is Zach Breeding. Zach is an AP scholar. He is the son of Mark and Gina, Mark Breeding and Gina Baronis. Mark plans to attend a university and swim and then go to law school, correct? Sure. Did I say your name? You said, you said Mark. Did I say Mark? I'm sorry. I saw your dad's name and I said Mark. And Zach plans to swim and then go to law school. Ladies and gentlemen, Zach Breeding. And last but not least, Claire Lancaster. And just, just so you know, Claire rushed over here from volleyball where she's getting ready to win the district championship tomorrow night, just so, so you know. Claire is, an AP, Claire is an AP scholar. She is the daughter of Scott and Kimberly Lancaster. Claire has, is undecided on a university, what, what university she will attend, but she plans on majoring in chemical engineering. Claire Lancaster. Okay, this next group of students is, uh, it's, this is a, an unusual situation that's really a pleasure to be able to, to introduce these students uh, for you, or to you. Um, it's going to take me just a minute, I want to explain the situation so that you kind of understand what, what happened here. Um, at the very beginning of school, we had a, uh, a community member contact me, uh, and she was very concerned that uh, one of her neighbors houses had been, I guess, tagged, for lack of a better word, or, for, or pranked by some high school students. We don't know who, what students did it, whether it were Midland High students, or I, I tend to think it was one of those private schools. <laughs> but <laughs> but we, didn't, we didn't know that. So, so anyway, she and I talked a little bit, and, and as the story went on, I found out that the, the residents there were from the recent immigrants to the United States, and, and uh, obviously new to Midland. Um, they they come from a from they're actually from Vietnam and they come from a situation where that kind of thing can be seen differently than we see it we're used to seeing that in the United States they were very concerned that it was possibly um, a hate crime or something in that order and were very very concerned and, and very wary about coming out of the house very wary about inter interacting with the community they were scared that's a good way of putting it they were scared and so uh, um, after talking to her I really felt like this was an opportunity for us to do something. So I went and talked to Major Spear and the ROTC, who I always rely on when I need something. They're great about responding. And so um, these seven students took a Saturday on their own time, went to that house, rubbed all the paint off the house, got it off. Anything else, there, were, uh, there was toilet paper in the trees. There was... Um, I don't know, they can tell you. I think there was pudding on the door. It, I, I don't know, it was all kinds of things there. But they cleaned that house up and uh, did a great job and spent, took their time to do that. And then I got a call about a week later from this, this same resident and she told me that that family was very grateful and uh, they, were, they were coming out of the house and they felt more comfortable in Midland than they had before. And so we certainly wanted to recognize these students. And so I'm gonna introduce the seven students that participated in this. Uh, first is Braden Woods. Keegan Parham, yeah, wait, 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 wait. Jacob Parsons, Dora Purchase, Thomas Pilot, Melina Morgan, and Bailey Britton. I think these students deserve a round of applause. Absolutely.
Okay, now, stay where you are. Don't move. Uh, guys, I don't know if y'all were in here uh, when we recognize one of our staff members. Uh, we, we give an award for those who we think, yeah, turn around, look at me. Thank you. <laughs> we, give, we give adults, non-school people, awards for what they do in, in our community for our children. We call it Hero for Kids. If, they, if anybody in our community just goes above and beyond the call of duty for, for kids, we call them Hero for Kids. Guys, I... When Mr. Grammer told me what you did, it, it truly moved me. It really did. I am, I am so proud of you. So we are going to start a new award tonight, and you guys are just going to be known as Heroes for Midland. And we, we have something for you. And, and doing this on your own and giving a Saturday, not many teenagers are going to give up a Saturday. <laughs> and you guys did, and you guys did it just to serve, to serve people who are in need and so we are very very proud of you so mrs nicholson is going to come around and give you your award and just know that you are everything we want misd students to be and to what we want them to look like and what we want them to do so very good job thank you Cassie, great human interest story right there. <laughs> and they had to scrub that door like you would not believe it. <laughs> <laughs> hope for the future day. That's right. Well, and, and this just to, for the, for the, just bear with me here, but I, I want to just tell you how much the ROTC means to Midland schools. I know it's the same way at Lee as is here. These guys are great, and they step up every time you ask them to do something, and it's not like you have to go beg. It's like they have to fight them off. They get too many volunteers. So these, we're, we're, this program is great, and I appreciate, I appreciate you supporting that, and uh, I hope that ROT stays, stays around for a long time. And just to show you the kind of character they have, we brought them here to honor them. They have an award for you guys. And so oh. I'm going to leave the podium and let Mr. Woods take over. Thank you, Mr. Grammer. Uh, every year we have our annual 9-11 Patriot Day Memorial, and we invited Mr. J. Isaacs and Dr. Ryder Warren as a uh, guest of honor, as you could say. And so for them too, we also we have a uh, certificate of appreciation. Oh. And for all the school board members that you do for our school board, we have a challenge coin. Each cadet will go by and shake your hand and give you a challenge coin when they come by. So just as, a certificate, as an appreciation for what you do and for. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, last thing, last thing to say about that, uh, Mr. Grammer. Um, board, you just need to realize the reason. A lot of the reasons why we have kids like we do is because we have leaders like we do. Mr. Grammer saw a need in our community, and he immediately acted. And a lot of that also, and he would not say this, but a lot of that has to do with him. Thank you, Mr. Grammer. Thank you. 
See, now we have to get to business. <laughs> are, there, are there any, did anybody sign up for public forum? No, All right, then we go to our district reports, the internal accountability system. Okay. Uh, team, I am very um, excited to bring you this report of, uh, on um, on our uh, accountability system. We've talked; I've, we've given you a couple of pre preliminary reports on this, and we're here to give the final. Uh, Elise and Patrick are going to do this for you, um, but let me just introduce this, and I, then I'll then I'll end it and tell you where we're going to go. Um, I am very pleased with the work TNL has done on this, with, with all those who, who put in the efforts to do this. Uh, I think this is going to drive us forward in, in talking about accountability and how we hold ourselves and how we rate ourselves as a school district and as campuses and, and, and for our children. Uh, the rationale for this, and we've talked about this before, you know, right now, that there are some other things that the state, especially at the high school level, the state throws in, but the, the number one indicator of success is now the STAR test. And, and we've talked about this for the last four years. Uh, a lot of us in this state, a lot of school districts, many, many school districts are struggling to show growth on the STAR. Um, and we, as a local school district, as an independent school district, cannot, it, to me, this is a mistake that the state has made over and over again, putting everything in one basket with one met metric being the gauge of, of learning and, and success. So that is for us is we really need to define ourselves and look and, and create those, uh, those metrics that we think are going to drive us forward. Uh, so uh, in, in talking, and, and you, have an, you have an outstanding team who really got in and, and, and worked on this, worked on those hard data points and the soft data points that what we're going to use for this internal accountability system that can be communicated to our parents, our caregivers, and to our students about what, what, where the bars are in, in MISD and what bars we want them to hit. Uh, the, the data points will be indicative of success, will be much more than, uh, they will be much more inclusive than just the STAR test. We're going to look at several different metrics and, and we really, and, and those of you know, we have been talking about the culture of our district since day one this school year. And I've been very pleased with our building principals and what they're trying to do uh, on their campuses and what we're trying to do at the district level is to really conduct extensive reviews of the culture that we have and what we believe in and what we believe kids can do and what we, what we uh, see in them to make those data-driven decisions for every single classroom that we have. So. There are several data points, and of course we have to use the STAR. That is the state's indicator of success, and so the STAR definitely will be in our internal accountability system, but also look at the things that we think are important. Folks, we, uh, and I don't know if we've told you this before, but we have, we have one of the lowest attendance rates in the state. We, and in talking about the culture of our community, the culture of the, getting our kids to school has, has been a struggle for us, and, and Lisa and, and Patrick will talk more about these, those kind of things and what we've seen. Our early reading indicators, mo one of the most important indicators that we have to get kids to success, you know, if we're going to get them reading on grade level by third grade, th those early reading uh, indicators are going to be hugely important as we move forward. Our graduation rates, uh, something we, you've, talk you've talked about for years and years and years, our PBMAS results, all four categories. Our community and student engagement components, now the new law is that we uh, assess how we are engaging our, our community, gonna be hugely important as moving forward. Those students that you just saw, increasing the number of kids that are, that are, uh, are taking our AP courses and who are, are, are being successful on our AP courses and our dual credit courses. We're, we're having some really good conversations right now with Midland College of expanding. Uh, Jeff Horner's taking the lead in that and expanding the course loads, uh, the co course offerings for our dual credit courses. Uh, we've talked to you about our PLCs. This, this again goes into our culture question. How do we speak with each other? How do we team with each other to, uh, to be successful at, on our campuses? So PLCs are in, in, in the, and how we implement that with fidelity and success is going to be a, a large component of our uh, proposed data. And then, uh, and then our customer service survey results. Um, this is the, one of the most exciting things that, that I'm going to be involved in, in really showing our parents, showing our staff that we have to know their opinions of, of us and how we're doing. 
uh, surveys of our central office departments, surveys of our campuses, surveys that, what, that parents can really latch on to and tell us what we're doing good and what we, what we definitely need to improve on. So that's gonna, be, that's gonna be exciting. So Patrick and Elise are gonna come up and take you through this and how we're going to, how we're going to uh, track our data points, the goals that we have already set for ourselves in, in addition to uh, tracking those uh, the data points, and then I will finish up with uh, where we go from there. So. Hey, Dr. Warren, let me Sorry. stop before you step down. Uh, <coughs> or you're, you're welcome to please sit. sit. I, didn't, I didn't mean it that way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess two comments. One, this is an outstanding starting point, and I like what I'm seeing. Two, we need to make sure that we incorporate anything that's coming out of our business um, community groups that we're working with because they are going to have some some thoughts ideas recommendations whatever it might be of which we might be able to adapt and add to this so i want to make sure that we all have great. that in our mind and that we're great comment that we're, we're thinking <coughs> about that and then i guess thirdly um i'd like to make sure that that we communicate as hard as we can with this community to where they can see where we are trying to set our own accountability targets and that this community fully understands and embraces what we're trying to do here so that we don't just get hung out to dry on star results yeah absolutely and and so i don't know if it's newspaper or whatever other media forms that we can um, whether it be board members talking to ptas or or you talking to ptas We've got to make sure that this gets out because I like what I'm seeing here and just on the surface already. Sure. But we've got to communicate this. This is this whole thing is going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger with our partnership with this community, and we've got to make sure it's being communicated. Mr. Isaacs, it's, it's as if you have been sitting in on our sessions. I promise I haven't. Uh, those, <laughs> those are the... Um, uh, that's the charge we have received from Dr. Warren uh, along the same lines. Um, these 11 data points that we're going to share with you today are a starting point. Uh, they're going to start the conversation, especially as we move into a, a three to five year strategic plan. It has not only to do with teaching and learning, but it has to do with operations and uh, business services as well. And part of uh, this plan is, uh, has components uh, with hard and soft data points. Soft data points meaning getting surveys out there to communicate with our community, with our employees, with our students, our parents, so we can gauge where we are in, in their eyes so they can take this journey with us in developing this strategic plan for MISD. Um, I'm going to set a step aside, and Elise is going to go through all of the data points with you, but we truly want this to be a process where it's not only the school and our businesses, but as, as, as also our employees and our students and parents as well. Well, and I would add to uh, Mr. Isaac's comments, not only communicate to the community what we think is important, but hear from the community what they think is important, and if they want to add anything to the culture that we're trying to grow and when dr. Warren gave us the charge to get this taken care of this summer we immediately started on it when we actually started we had over 30 data points and we dropped it all the way down to eight and then we landed on 11 and the 11 that we picked that you can see here are things that we can communicate to the public that we believe the pu public can buy into and understand <laughs> and doesn't dive too much into data points that non-educators wouldn't have would have to study to understand so we just wanted to make it plain and simple for the average person in the community of midland to understand and to be able to to take it and run with it and so that we can do just that communicate to everyone and then segue perfectly into the strategic plan that we are looking forward to doing and the work that we're doing with the business community so. yes Yes. Right. And the charge we were given, just TNL to start with, and then the the, when we start doing the strategic planning, that would encompass everyone. So, so basically what we're looking at are, are data points to get us through this school year so that we weren't 
just um, roaming around this school year. We wanted to make sure that we had a, a true hard focus for this, and that's where we are. Uh, this chart right here that you have, I'm not going to go over each point because there's slides that correspond with each of these data points, but it just gives you some historical information on whether or not we have data available and the information that we're looking at in respect to the data. <clears throat> so when we move forward, the first thing we're going to be doing is looking at our refined 88% attendance. And when we look at it, attendance, we all know that attendance is critical when we're talking about intense daily instruction. Whether or not the kids are there has a big impact upon how we impact what they're learning. Um, we know that we have to atten uh, improve attendance across the board. What you're seeing up here is the last information we had reported from the state for attendance was in 2012 and 13. And um, our, our attendance then was 95.9%. We have been steadily declining since 2011 and 12. And so we definitely are making a focus on that. Teresa's department is um, working on some things that they're doing with the truancy officers to assist in that area. Because uh, as a district, we do earn, according to David, $32.32 per student which um, on 187 days of attendance comes out, out to over $6,000. And I'm not going to go any deeper than that because I get lost. <laughs> so, um, but uh, we're doing a lot of things to work on attendance. So our target for attendance, and you can see how it steadily declines over the year as well for each six weeks. So we're looking, we're, we're really looking at what we can do to keep that steady throughout the school year. But our target for 88% attendance for this school year is 96%. 96% is, is, is what we're looking at. And we are communicating this. Uh, principals have already been made knowledgeable of everything that we have on here. So we're working toward that. Well, because 96% um, is significant based on where we are, and it's two years in arrears. So we're also looking at um, trying to improve something we won't even really see for a couple of years. So the information that we're going to have coming out in the Texas um, <coughs> Academic Performance Report will be a year behind already. And this target goes less than years. If we need to make it go up, we'd love to make it go up. <coughs> And if we go back a slide. And you can see the. <laughs> okay. All right. The next indicator we had was the K2 early reading indicator. And this information on the K2 early re reading indicator is generated from iStation reports. And it is inclusive of all of our students, both Spanish speakers and English language uh, English speakers. And it's submitted every year to the state through PEAMS. Um, and the way you look at this is backwards. So we want to decrease our numbers on this one. So when you're looking at the chart, we have um, for last year uh, the number of students that were not assessed. And this could be for a variety of reasons, a variety of reasons for why they're not assessed. And then we have our kids that are not eligible for accelerated reading instruction. That means they fell into the tier where they do not qualify for the accelerated reading instruction. And then you can see our number was 36% last year for the number of students that are eligible, which is a decrease from the year before, which is good. We want that number to go down. So when we look at this, um, we are going for a 16 point increase a decrease, sorry. We're looking for a 16-point decrease on this one. <coughs> so um, we're looking at going to 22%, is that right? Help me out, 24%. Let me go backwards. My apologies. Yeah, 20%. That's why I taught English. <laughs> we believe that um, our English Actually, our, our bilingual students have made a positive impact on that number. Uh, and we, we expect that to continue with what's going on in the bilingual classrooms. What we're looking at next are STAR measures of performance because that is the state assessment and it is important. We wanted to go ahead and keep it in there. 
So uh, we have met standard that we'll look at, met progress, and level three performance for these. When we're looking at these, first we're gonna look at met standard, and you got a lot of numbers on this. The easiest way to remember what we're doing is the TNL focus this year is to see what we can do to impact as many of the economically disadvantaged students as we can. We believe if we're positively impacting economically disadvantaged performance, then we're really going to be impacting not only our special ed students, but also our English language learners. And then as well, that will also significantly not only impact our all student performance, because those are some of our lowest performing students historically, but it will also impact our uh, PBMAS numbers. So when we look at that, our target on this one is um, our, our performance has been 52% and our target is going to be 68% for this coming school year. So you're looking at a 16 for 16 as well on this. And, and I'll give Mr. Horner credit. We don't like to give him credit very often, but we're going to give him credit for 16 points for 2016 is how we came up this to help you remember. So, but what I've done is I've given you all students, I've given you economically disadvantaged students performance in all subject areas, and then also special ed students, and then our um, English language learners performance. So that you can have a cross view. So instead of looking at um, our student groups specifically by ethnicity, we're looking at different areas here. The next area we move into is star met progress. We've had a lot of emphasis on campuses about meeting students where they are and helping them progress throughout the school year. That's our primary focus, is we wanna make, every, make sure that 100% of our students are progressing. When we look at star met progress, we've, we've got some, some things that you need to be aware of. It only measures reading, math, and writing, and it doesn't measure every student in writing. When we look at all students, we have st the state results and MISD. When we look at special ed, state and MISD. ELL, state and MISD. However, when you look at the economically disadvantaged performance, you'll notice the state is not, not available. The state doesn't measure this in index two, and so therefore we don't have that information. However, we have another program that assisted us in running the data so that we would again have our economically disadvantaged student performance available. So our target on this one as well is 16 for 16. So we're looking to gain 16 points in each of those areas in our performance. We believe that, yes sir. Absolutely. Yes. We made some progress for the economically disadvantaged or. I can add that in there. We can. The state doesn't measure that. There's a chance that I would have that information in the uh, TAPR, the Texas Academic Performance Report, but we don't even get that till November. We could look at adding that. You bet. The next one is, uh, our, well, this is the next, this is the same one. These are our growth targets. We wanted you to be able to see that. So when we look at our economically disadvantaged student group, you can see that uh, in all subjects, reading, math, and writing, we had a 48% performance rate, and so our target is 64%. And you'll notice that it's the one without the state. The rest have the state. So we are definitely setting a lofty goal on this because we're looking at surpassing the state but we believe that what's going on in, on campuses with our collaboration through the PLC model and with what we're doing with Lead Forward, that um, we are 
definitely seeing some positive impact on discussions that are occurring on campuses and filtering into classroom instruction. This shows. For ourselves, are we are we setting a target that we feel like that is, a, is attainable? And the reason why I ask that because sometimes you set a target that is kind of hard to reach, and it's sometimes if you don't make you don't reach that target, then it's kind of a downfall to an individual or to a group if you're not reaching that reaching that target. These, that goal. these are very high standards we're setting for ourselves. So to say we're going to meet every single one of them, I cannot tell you yes or no. But these, I can just tell you, Tommy, I, and I understand exactly what you're saying, but where, where we are as a district, and, and, and the, the, of course, this is STAR, but with, with all the other data points, I think there are several of these that we have a real chance of, of meeting. And, and, and I think that and one, some of the communication that we're going to do, especially with our parents, is we, we are going to raise the bar. We're going to raise the bar for our children. And, and so uh, there, there will be some that we're going to, we're going to fail. To meet this year, but we are we are going to set some very high goals for ourselves, and then we've done this the first year, and then it'll be very interesting to see where we go from there. Especially once we get the business group in, the parent uh, the parent uh, input in, and what this this internal accountability system really turns into. That's going to be very interesting to see how we do that moving forward. No, that's a, Tommy, that's a great point. The, the, the challenge that we have, though, is we still have to comply with the state's accountability system. And, and uh, our friend, um, Commissioner Williams, has told us that they, beginning this school year, they're going to start ratcheting up the standards year by year to year to get to the committee recommendations by 2021, that 2020, 21 school year. Yeah. So, so not only do we have to set our own goals that will move us up, we still have to make sure that we're hitting those goals that the state is mandating. Good, good point for you. And one, one, one thing we're doing also is we're not requiring the campuses to mimic our goal. The 16 by 16 is a teaching and learning goal. So if a campus, because all the campuses have fall different, we're looking at the average for us. So all the campuses are basing their goals based upon their results. So, but we're asking them not to go. If they need 16 points, go for 16 points. So, um, this slide is also the growth targets, just showing your uh, the special ed student group and the ELL student group and their growth targets. And one one thing I failed to note is in all of the star information that you're seeing when you see math. The results that you're seeing in this chart for math for this year is only Algebra 1 because we didn't have math in results for this school year. Okay, the next one is STAR Level 3. This is Advanced Level 3, which you know was a district um, focus last year. And this is where kids perform at a higher rate, the, the percent of kids we have performing at a higher rate on the STAR test. And when you look at this chart, you have a three-year view of the state level three performance for economically disadvantaged students and then the district performance for the economically disadvantaged student groups. So when we look at this one, what we did is obviously 16 points isn't gonna work for this one because the state's not even at 16. So what we wanted to do for this year is we wanna match the state's performance in 2015. So our targets are nine, 12, four, eight, and 11. We're just matching what, this, what the state did last year, which is gonna be significant work for us in that area. We're looking forward to see what happens with that one. So again, we're matching the 2015 state results. So when we look at the targets, then you can see here, it just mimics. 
The next area we have are graduation rates. You all know how important graduation rates are. And um, we have been having lots of talks with campuses about graduation and career and college readiness from pre-kindergarten on. And you know we're losing a significant amount of kids between seventh grade all the way through graduation. So we want to do everything that we can. We are currently six percentage points below the state on our graduation rate. And the last rate that we have is right here in 2014. And you can see that we were um, fairly even for two years. We went down a little bit, and then we went up again in 2014. So the goals that we have for graduation is we want to get to 86%. So when you look at that one, the 2015, you can see here I have a box around it, and I, I've, I've gone over this with y'all before. We can't do anything about this because that's set and done. But what we did is um, I've had, Ms. working with Ms. Acosta, I've told her by 2018 we want to see a district graduation rate of 90% by 2018. So we've, what we did as a TNL executive staff is we backed that up, and it's basically a 2% incremental change each year is what we're looking at. The next one is our lovely performance-based monitoring assessment system. We all love PBMAS. And uh, as TNL, I can tell you we all believe that the work that we're doing and focusing on our economically disadvantaged students, our English language learners, and our special ed students will positively impact the results on here. Because where we stand in PBMAS, when you dive into the data, it really impacts those three student groups. So what we want to do in PBMAS staging, which comes out this week, is we want to decrease one level of staging for each of the areas, special ed, no child left behind, CTE, and bilingual ESL. CASE is the Community and Student Engagement Survey. And this is where the campuses all rate themselves, and then that um, moves into a district performance rating. Our rating. Our self-rating the past two years has been a two, which is recognized. Uh, they go with the old standard system of exemplary, recognized, acceptable, and unacceptable. On this one, think of it as a golf score. Just like PBMAS, the lower the score, the better. So our target in, on the case this year is we want, to have a, we want to have a one as a district for the case rating. And the case rating actually moves in in two years. We'll be moving into the accountability system as 10% of every um, district and campus rating. Our next area is advanced placement exam performance. Our performance for the district has been increasing for the past three years. We want to see that continue to increase. And we want to be able to prepare them for that. So you can see as we look across three years, we've gone from 35.3 up to 42%. And the state this past year performed at 49. They've actually, they had a little bit of a de decline. The way this is rated is uh, it's taking the number of students we have that are enrolled in AP classes and that test on the AP and what percent scores three or higher. And that's how we determine that. What we did is we looked at state performance. We actually took the highest state performance over the last few years, which was 52, and that's what we determined as our target, is we want to match the state's highest performance so far at 52%. You may not know the answer to this, but um, of the students we have who take AP courses, how many of them actually take the AP exam? Mr. Horner, do you have that off the top of your head? <coughs> I don't remember. Like half of them, three fourths of them, or who knows? It, I'd say it's between 40 and 50 percent. Okay. So it should be a high number. Okay. We can get you that number. Oh. Okay. That, that number has increased a little bit since we took the charge. Since 2013, we had 498, and uh, this past year we had 510. Uh, so we have a number uh, going up slightly. Next, we have our dual credit courses. 
what this chart jo shows is the top half of the chart shows the number of students we have in the court that are completing the courses successfully and the number of students that are attempting a, a completion is a C or higher in those courses and then down at the, the bottom half it just turns those into percents so that you can see how that is our goal is 90 percent we want 90 percent of our students in dual credit courses successfully completing those courses The next slide is labeled collaboration, and this is collaboration through the PLC model. And basically what this shows is what we've been doing and where we plan to be in the next couple of years and for this year. So last year we were in a planning and preparation stage. This year we have 18 campuses that we expect to be in phase one of implementation. When we have 20 campuses that we are exposing to the collabor collaboration model. And next year, we are hoping to have all the 18 campuses. Well, we're not hoping. We will have 18 campuses in year two. And then we do, um, David's going to give us some money to put 20 other campuses in implementation. <laughs> so our target for this year is successful implementation at 18 campuses. And you may be asking, what is successful implementation? We'll be able to give you that information later because we actually had an entire meeting this today uh, before and after the board luncheon on what that means. And so we will be moving into that. Good job. Very good job. I okay. have a question. Yes, sir. Relative to improving our ability to communicate among subsequent and enrolled students, has any discussion come down the pike relative to floating our board meetings across the community so that we are in touch literally we we haven't even talked about that but that I, I would not have important. a yeah I think uh, it would enhance our credibility for one. if if the, we actually did that in Marble Falls the first two to three uh, meetings of the year would always be at a different campus just to, that that was kind of our luncheons we did that for our lunch so I, that's completely up to you guys. No, relocate. Yeah. Every other meeting, every that's completely up to you. Creating a sense of ownership. Okay. Let me let me finalize. Let me finish this. Um one of the most critical components of what James is just saying, one of the most critical components for me is listening to our stakeholders and really being able to change our culture around the perceptions, the truths that our stakeholders have with an emphasis on our parents um, as we move forward. So really changing our culture and, and doing a really study, a qualitative study of ourselves. Um, we've talked about this uh, since day one, uh, uh, this coming school year. You, we, we're talking about the difference between a healthy school culture and a toxic school culture and the main the main difference is how we view children. Are we a healthy school culture that we say that we know that in our hearts that every child has the ability to succeed in, in difference of a toxic school culture which basically puts the onus of learning on the kids themselves? I mean, the toxic school culture gives us an out. It gives us an excuse that the kid is not engaged, they, they're not concerned, they don't have prior knowledge, they don't have a, a, a willingness to comply with our rules, it gives us an out to reach them. Then that a, means we're gonna have to be very deliberate slash delicate in terms of how we use the term economically disadvantaged. Absolutely right. Because the perception out there in too many instances reflects our putting that blame on a particular segment of our student population. Right, absolutely. And one of the points that we talked about just this last 18 meeting, James, is that students don't know their socioeconomic status. Kids don't. They have to be taught that. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important things that we're gonna do is listen to our parents. Here are the truths that we looked at 
for parenting. Uh, you, you guys know I went to uh, a, uh, a uh, very, very good conference a couple of weeks ago. One of the most important things they talked about was parent involvement and what, what we truly do as a school district to involve parents. The number one thing up there is regardless of race and economic status, if parents are involved, kids achieve more. That's, the data shows it. If we can positively engage parents and caregivers, the parents are going to uh, the dance. So our questions, and I'm sorry this is so small, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't know it was gonna be printed this small. Our questions to us is, how do we assess our plans? Do our schools truly have a plan to involve parents? Do we have practices, policies, and procedures? So this involves you too. This in involves board policies. Do we have policies that put roadblocks up for parent involvement? Do we systematically ensure that parents hear us, see us, and they see us having a sincere effort to really uh, make, uh, make the, a priority for the school? Do, our, do, our, do we talk to our parents about what do we expect from them? What, what are our expectations for our parents? And which parents are, are we targeting? Are the parents that we really need to talk to coming to school? Are, are, are only the, the most involved parents? We just had a huge group of the involved parents in our kids' lives and what those, those parents look like. As my wife went to Lee High School a couple of weeks ago for, for Stan's open house, and it was wonderful. But she saw the same 75 play, uh, faces that she's seen for the last six years through junior high, through the freshman schools, all it's the same faces. We've got to involve all, we've got to involve more. All right, so one of the most important things that we're trying to do right now, we have identified, and, and, and let me, I love doing this, but I always have to start with an apology. Uh, I did not have this ready to go by budget time. We didn't, we were still researching, but uh, K-12 Insight is a, is a company that we really wanna engage to do the stakeholder engagement surveys to, to survey our parents, to survey our staff, to survey all of us on what our perceptions are. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna have a significant cost for us to be able to do that. A lot of different school districts have, use SurveyMonkey, which is free. The, the problem being is, guys, we do not have the staff to, to really to be able to create good, valid surveys, to be able to send those off. And then the, the main point is to be able to extrapolate that data and turn it into data that we can truly use. Uh, our, you, our third floor staff, if you, if you know any of our third floor staff, you know they are running and sprinting, just getting the, the, de the testing data that we need to uh, done as we do it. So I'm going around to several different groups trying to drum up support to be able to pay for this. I would really, we can do Survey Monkey this first year. I just don't want to. I think we can really make a splash with this and really get the results that by, by the end of this school year to really get the results in to show us exactly what people think about this school district, what our employees think about us as a central office, about our departments, about the, the, the different things that we do. So that's uh, that's something uh, that we're going to uh, that we're going to be looking at. I, I, like I said, I would really like to. Uh, to be able to bring that to fruition by the end of the school year. All right. Talk to me more about that. I'm not sure I'm 100% understanding what you're talking about. Oh, K-12? K -12. Right. What I'm hearing you say is that they, they, will, uh, they, they will come in and they will do an assessment, a planning study of what we need. What are, we, what are, what are our issues? What are uh, the things? And of course they work with, Jay, they work with school districts all over. So we, we don't, we may have some unique issues, but we also have issues that a lot of different school districts are looking at as well. So they will construct for parents, for staff members, a valid survey to be able to extract the, the, the data, the soft data points that we need to, to fit them within our internal accountability system. They will actually create the school, they will, they, and the, the two and three are two different surveys. Two is for parents on what they think of our schools and, and the perceptions they have on our schools, three is us. It's our employees and what they think of, of the district itself and how we, are, how we do things, how we conduct our business, and what is the perception of our staff, uh, teachers, everybody uh, of the district. And then they will come in, that number four, the number four component is, they will come back to us with the data in hand and show us here's what we found here and here's what other school districts have done when when we get these kind of results some will be very positive some will not be very positive at all here's what other school districts have have done to turn those around 
I don't even know. Uh, may we we looked at several different companies that that do these kind of things. I don't know if we even entertain Region 18. I mean, Region 18. Oh, I can give you that question, that answer really quickly. If that's what you were talking about, yeah. Yes, they do. I would love to ask that question of Mr. Thomas. <laughs> All right, I'm very excited about this. I really am. Uh, again, please pat your TNL staff on the back. Everybody who was involved in this—not it wasn't just TNL, but everybody who was involved in this—please pat them on the back. And I think this is going, uh, again, first year of implementation. Year two, year three, year four may look totally different from this, but 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 we're going to have an internal accountability system that we're going to have an agreed to notion in this community that this is this is what our graduates are going to look like because we we have a school district that have these metrics in place to create the graduate that we're all going to be proud of. Yes, sir. Based on the commissioner's recent comments about phase two, I guess. It was. Yes, sir. Start. How, if at all, has the TNL's plans or conversation reflected those potential? Patrick, you want to take you want to take that one? Or phases? No, I'm sorry, I hadn't, I hadn't just gotten together. <coughs> you want to hear it? Well, sure. Basically, what the commissioner is doing with the new phasing standards is good for our district. And what you're looking at is, and we are working on something in my department and accountability department to make it explainable across the district to campuses, parents, board, everybody, is instead of phase two being this year, basically phase two is in the middle. It's in two and a half years. And when we looked at, let's see what I look at. I think I looked at um, algebra one. It's a difference of four questions in that two and a half years. What the commissioner's doing makes absolutely s perfect sense. They should have done it begin with. Instead of doing this for the phase in, it's a straight line going across the years. So incremental. So it's for our district, it's very good and should assist some of our campuses. Any, any other questions? Um, I'm very excited about this. Thank you all very much because we need to have something more than just the star test to judge whether we're doing the right thing or not. So uh, congratulations to everybody involved. And I at least am excited to see how this turns out as we go forward. Okay, next. Mr. Holly. 
Michaels. And evening. Uh, we have a brief but exciting report uh, re regarding the <laughs> regarding the the progress that we've made with the Wi-Fi and the implementation of the Wi-Fi infrastructure at all, all the secondary schools. And of course, we want to talk about all the all the great things that will do for us and how we'll be able to put that to good use. So, a B B Y O D, bring your own device. Also, some plans we have uh, for the rest of the school year for grades six through twelve, which would create uh, student accounts in Google and Gaggle. And Mike has a has a PowerPoint that I'd like to ask him to to just talk through those slides. After which, we would certainly uh, uh, you know, receive re receive and welcome your questions regarding these initiatives. Okay, and first of all, I just really wanted to start by saying thank you so much for approving this measure. Uh, I, I'm coming in this year as Director of Instructional Technology, and so I was new to it. So I, I wanted to, of course, thank you for approving this and Dr. Warren for, for your part in it. Uh, Mr. Jeff Horner has been a huge asset as well going through with this Bring Your Own Device initiative. And also my predecessor, Selene Hubbard, has done an amazing job to get things well thought out and prepared, and it really has been an amazing team effort. So again, uh, BYOD is bring your own device. This is what we're doing for our secondary students. Coming from elementary myself, it's been very humbling uh, as I was helping out over the summer in secondary to see the, the difference in the technology that we currently have in elementary and secondary. And of course, that's fine and well. The bond came and we, we had that amazing opportunity to increase in elementary, but we don't have the funding to really do what we would like, of course, with secondary technology. So I'm going to show you a little bit of, of what our plans are, where we're at, and where we're headed with the, with the BYOD initiative. <laughs> I actually had Mr. Fuller for my freshman year. I got a B, and I was very happy, <laughs> very proud to have that B. So <laughs> It was the English one, so I was, I, that's one of my proudest bees I've ever owned. <laughs> one of many bees, but one of my prouder bees. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> if I was in, I would have 16 for 16, but I, <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. So again, what this means is that our secondary students are going to be able to bring their web-enabled devices, uh, and that's going to come once the campuses are ready. They will receive, uh, we have a, a standard parent letter that will go home. That will be once the course, the infrastructure is there and once the, camp, the campus has their procedures in place to get started. Uh, we did change the language in our network use agreement to include everything that would adopt for BYD, so we don't have yet another form for them to sign. So signing the basic network agreement for this year will cover them for BYOD. We have also have a handbook that's been written that has a lot of the frequently asked questions. Again, I really have to give credit to uh, to Selene Hubbard, my predecessor, as well as, as Mr. Horner for his part in that. And I've kind of just been going in and, and moving around a little bit of what they've started. But uh, we also created a very easy, just midlandisd.net slash BYOD. You can go there and find that information. And in that handbook, you've got uh, FAQs, frequently asked questions for parents, students, and teachers. So uh, that's just another great initiative. And everything we have is going to be in that spot. So it'll be one easy place if they they can go to our website and either search BYOD or just go to that web address slash BYOD. <laughs> so the network terms of service, this is uh, very standard as most people would see. For example, if you've ever stayed at a hotel, you, you're agreeing to those terms of services. Uh, the, whoever did this was a genius, but they, they decided we would not have a password. God bless them for that because, as you know, getting Wi-Fi passwords can be difficult to get everyone on. Uh, again, they, they won't have to sign on with the password. However, they will have to agree to our terms of service. Uh, I won't go into to reading that for you right now. I'd be happy to if you'd like me to. Uh, but you can also find that on the BYOD website. Basically, it talks about the fact that uh, this isn't an, a secure network, so you always want to be cautious about the data you put up there. And it will also mention that uh, these drives will be monitored because we always want students to know what they're doing on the school devices, just as we want our instructors to know as well. Anything, I, I always try to remember that when I send an email. Do I want this read on Channel 9 News? If you don't want what you're going to put in an email with the school device read on the news, then you definitely shouldn't put it out there because we just want to remind them that it is a public domain, just both for our educators and for our students. And again, uh, all that is right there on the BYOD portion of our website. 
Google is another wonderful company. They have provided all of our student accounts, which we have over 12,500, that we literally created with a click of a button. And uh, we actually ran out of accounts. We had to ask for more. Uh, we created those on October 1st, and they've been created for all 6th through 12th grade students. Uh, the students can log into their accounts. They can go to the student links page, which most students will be familiar with already. And we also have the directions for those students to log in for the first time. So those accounts are created. They're ready to go. And even if it's even for those campuses that aren't ready for BYOD, if some of the instructors wanted to start this where they could do certain things at home with certain students, they could do that. Now, what Google gives them free access to is uh, Google Classroom, Google Docs, Sheets, and Slides. Uh, Docs is very similar to Microsoft Word. It's web-based, and it's, again, beautifully free. Sheets is the uh, similar to the Microsoft Excel. And Slides is, and actually, I created this in Slides. Um, it's similar to Microsoft PowerPoint. Of course, the biggest difference, again, is that it's web-based, and it's of no charge. Uh, all Google Drive activity will be monitored by Gaggle. And what Gaggle is, is a third uh, party monitoring company, and I'll talk about it in the next slide, that will monitor the activity. And, now, and I want to be clear too, now that's going to only monitor the activity within the Google Drive accounts. It's not going to monitor their text messages, it's just going to monitor the things they're doing that are educationally based and academically based. Again, we have to respect certain student rights to privacy, and all of that will be monitored by Gaggle. Uh, Gaggle is also known as safety management for Google Apps. Again, this is going to monitor anything they put in Google Docs, Sheets, or Slides, as well as within the Google Classroom. Uh, it allows them to enhance the safety of Google Apps for education, which includes all of that software I've just mentioned, and it's 24-7 filtering. Uh, what we do is we assign three district emergency contacts. I'm one of them, Chief Colburn, uh, who is here, was also one of them, and Mr. Hawley is one of those for those district emergencies. And the reason they have those contacts is because they're actually not just monitoring for, as you can see here in the second paragraph, they're, they're, they're looking, there's an anti-pornography scanner, a block words list, and then they're also monitoring for cyberbullying and suicidal outcries. Uh, and there, there have been instances where you know someone will get a call at three in the morning saying, "Hey, a student has made either a threat at another student tomorrow, or has made uh, some type of threat towards their own life or their own well-being." So this is something that now this service we did pay for. It's a uh, this was paid for by the technology department. It's a it's a flat rate three dollar and fifty cent fee per student f per year. And again, that's just uh, something that we felt is necessary for compliance in, in regards to uh, protecting students' uh, safety and just in regards to help with the management of things as well. That wasn't me, I promise. <laughs> that was not my phone. <laughs> Mine's off, I swear. Uh, again, they, they have two portions of this. So they, they will be scanning it with software. Again, they have the blocked words list, and they not only use words that are inappropriate, but if a student uses an ampersand instead of an A, they look for that too. And uh, they also have individuals that, that comb over it as well. So it initially goes through a software to find things. If there's something that is inappropriate, for example, uh, students using language they shouldn't, that will go to one of us, and eventually it will also be going to an assigned person on the campus. And again, that's just gonna be, when you have 12,000, and I believe we have 12,400 student accounts currently in Gaggle, that's a, that's a lot of people to look over. So you definitely need help with that, and you want uh, software and also realize on it. So I think Gaggle is, is going to be money very well spent to in, in, ensure that we keep our students safe and that we're doing everything we can to as we go into this new frontier of, of bring your own device, we want to make sure we've done everything on our part to keep our kids safe. Now on the timelines, we're really, this, you're not going to believe this, but there's a few things that were, I don't know if you, if you guys have ever heard of this phrase, it's called ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this, I, when I heard that, because uh, some of these schools were, were planned uh, to be done by the end of the year, and, and, and some of them are already done, some of them late spring, and they're already done. So. That, you know, coming from anything in construction and anything in construction involving Midland right now.
question of what is the standard of review and we have some thought on what we should do. And then finally, by January, February of 2016, we'll have our fully November review. Um, because we're going to have our final. Uh, I've been very happy with the progress they've made uh, in regard as in regards to wireless infrastructure. I do know that we are still working a little bit on Goddard because of the fact that we have so many affordable sales. I believe we have about 15 portable buildings and we're working on getting those access points in right now. So again, this is just, I, it, am I still brief? <laughs> this is just a, a brief presentation of where we're at. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's my last slide. So. Uh, if there's any questions, please, uh, I'd be happy to answer them or any any clarifications you would need. It's, it's, it's certainly more of a challenge. You're, you're going to have an access point uh, like you'll, you'll have in here. Uh, and so you have those. And of course, the wiring becomes an issue because you a lot of times have to have that networking cable run outside. So yes, that does pose uh, more of a challenge, but it is something that, of course, having so many portable buildings, we, we are used to it, unfortunately, uh, going over it. And I, do, I don't do that part of it, but I do know it is a challenge. And, and just from my own experiences, that's why I probably see more issues within the portable buildings. But it is possible. Thank what you. are your plans for the students to be sure they are engaged if they don't have their own gear to bring? Yes, thank you so much. And actually, Dr. Warren, that was one of his biggest concerns is um, what are you going to do for those students? So as we have um, adapted with our learn pads, for example, for, for our um, elementary, we, we have allotted enough to have a few per class to, to use. And then also, I know what uh, Mr. Horner had also mentioned in secondary and what we are going to do as well is we're going to really encourage some collaborative efforts where not everyone will necessarily need a device if it doesn't apply. The great thing is that for the most part, and of course you can never say 100% that everyone will have a device, but most of the students do have devices. And, and the great thing about going BYOD is once you have wireless internet installed, a parent has an old phone, someone donates an old phone, an old iPad, then they can get on web and have the full web experience. So it can be even be as simple as a smartphone that their parent no longer uses or that a family member no longer uses. And uh, again, from what we've seen and from what I'm sure the, the secondary principals can tell you when they're <laughs> picking them up, uh, there, there is a good amount of, of technology out there. However, of course, it's never 100%. So, so we're going we're gonna to hit it from two ways, from providing what we can, campus purchase devices, and then also, of course, teaching and training to do things collaboratively where you can use that technology. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Right. And again, quickly, just uh, just address a few things. Uh, we do have this on a network where it can't get into any of our infrastructure. So this guest access network only accesses the internet. It can't get into any network. So as far as viruses and things, it can't spread out that way because it's actually blocking from there. And uh, then with security, one of the biggest things it's going to be training. It's going to be uh, talk, talking to teachers and really monitoring it because at the end of the day what's what's scary is we've been BYOD this whole time it's just that it's been in their pockets and now it'll be on their desk <laughs> and so and instead of having to go to the restroom to text a friend or text their mom or whoever they text or to f do whatever they're they're doing they you know they can do these things out in the open so it will be a brave new world and of course we will have in, infractions because kids are going to be kids but uh, that is it's going to be a monitoring thing and honestly I think sometimes if you can just take the forbiddenness from it that will help too. If they can see, wow, I can really use this in a responsible way in class, they're going to be more apt to do it. But of course, they will. There will always be issues that arise, and we will address those as we would any other disciplinary infraction. 
Yes, sir. And you say all elementary campuses implementing BYOD. So how many of our sixth graders really will have access? Okay, that's a great question. And, and what we did is we actually provided, because we wanted, again, we talk about giving powers back to the campuses. So every campus may be a little different. Some have actually gone with the learn pads, some, some aren't. So I don't have a number for you right now, but I could definitely get that information for you. Um, I, I currently couldn't give you off the top of my head which campuses are or aren't, but. Well, just half of them, a fourth of them. I mean, ballpark's fine. Yes. And you know we're we're so new at that. I wouldn't you don't even, even want to. I okay. wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be. <laughs> my mom would would pull me out of here by my ear for fibbing. So I I, I couldn't give you a number, but okay, that's definitely fine. a number I'll be happy to right, to get to you. you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very thank much. You, sir. Community leadership meeting. Uh, about the 26th, I'd like to call a special meeting if Mr. Davis approves, and if not, maybe Mrs. Nicholson will. Just can do that. We have a we'll have a uh, we'll have a guest that night, uh, school attorney uh, David Thompson, who who wants to come and talk to us about uh, some a couple of things going on right now, and especially in the in the, the realm of school finance. So if uh, this will be a very important meeting, so if we can if we can reserve the 26th for that meeting, 5:30 p.m. Okay. Everybody good? Okay. Then number two, and the reason why I had this down is because originally the 26th, the uh, Jay, Jay uh, made a good point uh, during the discussion of the internal accountability system, having the really engaging the business group, really engaging the community is going to be paramount moving forward. Um, the, the BFI, the Business Funders Initiative, would like us to entertain a uh, uh, co-hosting a meeting. And we've done this before. They, they kind of stole the idea from us. Um, it's been a while since we did, but we want to engage the community leadership and talk to them about what our next steps are. Uh, academically, for, for facilities, uh, future bond issues, anything like that. And if you remember that, we did that uh, before we started the conversation about the elementary bond. So I think that's a very good idea. Sometime in November, I don't have a date nailed down yet, but are, are, is everybody okay again? And, and we, what we would have to do is probably uh, engage the ATC lecture hall because the we would be we would basically be inviting every leadership board in our community to be a part of this discussion um, city council county commissioners a hospital board a college board chamber board everybody so basically we would have about three to five to six different leadership boards having to call meetings to order remember how we did last time so it has to be very formal and everything like that are are, are we okay with uh, hosting that with leading that I thought you would be. I just want to make sure. Okay. So so I will shoot out some dates for you once I get with that group, and, and we have some dates in November to do that. I think that's that's a great first step to really kind of engage the leadership. What's the agenda going to be for that meeting? We may host it, but is, is giving out some of these data points? Yes. Going to be part of our presentation, or is it just for the country? Yes. I think, I think we're going to be working together to create an agenda you know i think the board i think the board and the funders group both have to agree fully to what that agenda is going to look like and what the information is going to be to be able to move forward okay, yep. okay that's all i had okay thank you any um david do you have comments about the financials or the bills any questions from anybody all right then we have the consent agenda any items from there you want to pull or have questions about then they are approved by general consent. Action items. All right, team. Uh, action uh, item A, uh, discussion of possible approval of school mascot and colors for Barbara Yarbrough Elementary School. They have had a vote of kids, of parents, of all stakeholders at Barbara Yarbrough Elementary, uh, they have requested that you approve the Mighty Tigers, Mrs. Arthur, <laughs> the Mighty Tigers uh, as the mascot and silver, blue, and purple. <laughs> the Jill, any, any comments?
Look at that. Hey. Well, that is good. Yes, yes. Agreed with that one. Board, I would recommend you approve the Tigers and the silver, blue, and purple for Yarborough Elementary School. Second. Moved by Mr. Bishop, seconded by Mr. Hernandez. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Oh, no, raise your hand. Raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Board. Thank you. It passed unanimously. Well, at least they didn't spell it all with the other sheet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Board, uh, uh, action item B, discussion of possible approval of MISD emergency operations plan. Uh, we have Chief Colburn and, and we have a special guest, Mr. Dale Little, our, our director of uh, the county emergency services. Dale, thank you for coming. We appreciate that. Um, David, any, any comments? Uh, just that uh, with the help of Mr. Little, uh, we've uh, had a, an emergency operation plan in place for quite a few years now. Uh, also, Region 18 uh, works very closely with us. They had uh, signed off on, on our plan of moving on with Plan 711. And uh, we're, we're, we're just proud that we uh, have a community that, uh, as far as first responders, that work closely with, with this plan. And uh, uh, Dale had pointed out to me that uh, at this point, it's a requirement now to have the school board sign off on the plan. So that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm tonight and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have in regards to the plan. It's dry reading and I apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an important document. Dale, what do you think? <clears throat> I think he's, he's done a wonderful job on it. We've uh, worked very closely with him. We've worked with Mendon College, UPPB, uh, hospital system. Uh, our plan for the county, I'm the city and county coordinator, so the plan for the city and county is over 900 pages. If y'all would like to read it, I can bring it up here any time. <laughs> but, um, They've done a good job. It fits in with all the local state plans and uh, we work with David uh, on nearly on a daily basis. So uh, I would recommend y'all well, approve. We you really do. appreciate your efforts. We really do. And, and David, always for you. Good job. I, I, I do have a question. I, yes. I guess this is pertaining to if you need to evacuate the buildings, et cetera. Is that a true statement? Or is it just something? I, I didn't get to read the whole. Uh, yes, in the plan it talks about not only evacuation uh, of the school on the school grounds, but our plan uh, also outlines splitting the city in half, uh, whether you would go to the SHAP Center or to um, uh, the Horseshoe Arena, which we had that fire that came close to Henderson a few years ago and uh, had the plan work beautifully, took everyone over to uh, Horseshoe and uh, one of the county commissioners ordered pizza for the kids to <laughs> get there. Worked out really well. well you know, and, and one of the things, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I would ask is as some of our buildings are, are aging and not have the same type of wiring that some of our new facilities are going to have, that if, if uh, a fire was to break out, like say here at the central office, does, does everybody know where to go? Is it, how do we know everybody's accounted for? Uh, that would actually be for Nick Stone to answer because he's in charge of all the fire equipment, alarms. Uh, we, we do like the new systems that are in the elementary schools because they actually make uh, announcements. So it eliminates the human factor and uh, it's a very, very smooth. Uh, as a matter of fact, Dale uh, works very close with the fire department too. So uh, as these doors open and close automatically yeah. to seal uh, areas off, uh, I do know that the fire department does require uh, when we do fire drills that everyone goes out the same route but they do yeah. require them to do a secondary yeah. route and, and tommy we actually i mean we do the same thing as schools do we actually have emergency drills here at the central office we haven't had one yet this school year but we had we had one last year the year before that so that and and we all get mad at each other because people have to walk down especially seven floor people <laughs> six floor people but we have we have stations we have stations yeah, out muster, in the parking areas. lot so that, yeah, muster areas so that uh, we all know where we're supposed to be if we have to fully evacuate. And every year, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Dr. Warren. Every year I do, we have uh, four leaders, and I make sure that that is always up to current because we do have people that move Sweet around bill. the district. So uh, we do have someone in charge of everything. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if I've told you all this. This is a good. Uh, the, uh, we are, we are re staffing our central office as it applies to our security staff uh we've had uh, 
n nothing horrendous happened, but we, we felt there was a need knowing that this building is wide open. As far as, of course, when we have seven floors, people can just kind of go anywhere on those seven floors not knowing that. So we're really going to ratchet up what we do here, how we check in visitors to our central office, and we're actually putting a security guard here on the first floor to be here with Sherry, who is our attendant here on the first floor. We're actually going to have a security guard who's actually checking in visitors knowing where they're going throughout the building to know we, that, we can, uh, that we can be safe for our staff here at the central office. That's a, that was a great question. Any other questions? So we should be impressed. There's only 24 pages here then, huh? You should be. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, in, in this type, sort of planning, uh, it's critical to keep the document as, as precise and, and the least amount of wording possible, and you have to use it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Team, I'd recommend approval. Is there a motion? Okay, uh, moved by Mr. Hernandez and seconded by Mr. Isaacs. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Passes unanimous. Thank you, board. Thank you, guys. Thank Appreciate you. you. Uh -huh. Class size waivers to TEA. Uh, board, discussion of possible approval of, t of class size waiver, page 84 is what we are requesting this year. We're going to request a total number of 41. Uh, um, the memo uh, uh, from uh, Mrs. Neighbors. Uh, actually breaks that down by grade level and by campus. And you see there are two main reasons for the class size waivers. Uh, and we had been going consistently down on those. You know, we, we hit our peak of over 100 uh, in the 11 12 school year when we had to cut so many staff because of the funding cuts from the TEA. And we've done, been doing a really good job ratcheting those down. Two main reasons for to the increase we've got about 20 to 22 uh, uh, waiver increase this year. Uh, number one, very much unexpected uh, growth spurt that we've had. Uh, team, I mean, last as of last Friday's numbers, we gained 45 kids last week uh, from what we had. <laughs> David does every time he goes. He goes riding around and tries to figure out where. We Um, they are, they have declined by about. Initially, they were about 200 down. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure. Where I don't think they're that far down now, but they've, they've declined a little bit. I talked to their super, I talked to, uh, to Mr. Crow just last week, and they're a little bit down, but they're just not seeing the growth like we are. Joanna? I'm seeing quite a few immigrants moving in, and they're moving in with families. So um, when you talk about housing, they're, they're housing together. Um, our enrollment has increased to maybe three on the ELL side alone. And I'll get you those numbers here pretty quick. We're trying, we're trying to finalize them, but we've got quite a few moving in from all over. It's got to be a Nigeria. Uh, to be able to lose students like we did at that time from a year ago, and then all of a sudden we Another another thing we looked at, Jay, is number uh, the other thing was our smaller communities. When when there is an economic downturn, even though we are very reliant on oil and gas in Midland, we are still a lot more diversified in our jobs in our in our, in our industries than the smaller communities. And we're seeing we're seeing some some growth from smaller communities into town because of of the diversity that's here. Yeah. So. Uh, second reason, uh, I, and I wanted to say this just to make you aware, um, 
we are in a what I call a chronic lack of applicants, of qualified applicants for teachers. We are, we are in real danger of having to uh, dissolve almost probably more than 50 positions this school year because there are just not applicants there. There are not applicants there or the applicants we would not put in front of kids. So uh, that, that worries me greatly. You know, we, we will deal with the growth. We will get back, David will get back in on his game of, of, of guessing how many kids are gonna be here. But what really worries me for us moving forward is just being able to, again, to retain those great teachers we have now, but to more so even recruit for the attrition that we do have, recruiting folks into our community who are who are quality educators. So, those are the those are the two main drivers of the 41 uh, uh, class size exemptions. I would recommend approval. What, what, what uh, just sort of explain to me what 41 the uh, substitute is. Uh, James, we we have had strains on our substitute group, group forever. Uh, Finding, finding. I mean, number one is not not very many people in Midland are working part time. You don't have very many people at all seeking those jobs working part time. That's the same issue we have, like with bus drivers. Uh, we just don't have a, a lot. We we don't have. Um, Jill Rivera is hurting just for creating PD time because we don't have substitute teachers to be able to uh, pull teachers out for uh, for B PD purposes. That has always been a challenge for us. Well. The reason I ask that question is I'm, I'm concerned that the substitutes that we do hire are competent and consistent in terms of delivery. And that kind of bothers me. Do we have this one? No. Any other questions? Is there a motion to approve the class size waivers? Motion by Mr. Isaac, seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. Campus improvement plans. Board, uh, starting on page 87 in your packet, you will see the beginning of the campus improvement plans. Elisa's um, um, memo is on page 85. Principals did, and their le campus leadership teams did a phenomenal job doing, you know, talking about everything that we've talked about, about our culture, about our academic goals, everything that we're doing. I think, uh, I know you've looked these over, you're gonna be very pleased with the goals that uh, every single campus has set for itself and what we're going to, uh, what we're going to do to, again, to culturally, to make our district into what we want that to uh, be. So I would recommend you approve the 1516 campus improvement plans. I would just comment that in years past when I've looked at these, they all looked so much alike. And this year, they don't. I mean, you really do get the feeling that the schools really worked on them. So thank you for thank that. You. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Isaacs moves and Mr. Hernandez seconds that we uh, approve the campus improvement plans. Everybody in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Oh, it can't be opposed because we all said yes. <laughs> it passed unanimously. <sighs> Candidates for the Midland Central Appraisal. Uh, board, board page 174 is David's memo about our Appraisal District Board of Trustees, the three that we have always had, David, correct? Mr. Kaufman, Mr. Stevenson, and Mr. Kamick have all agreed, uh, if it's your pleasure, to serve again. Um, and again, uh, th this, is, this is totally your pleasure. Uh, moved by Mr. Fuller, seconded by Mr. Isaacs, that we approve the candidates for the Midland Central Appraisal District. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. Thank you, board. The issuance of Midland ISD tax and revenue. Look at all that. So. Okay, <laughs> discussion and possible oh. approval of resolution authorizing the issuance of MISD tax and revenue anticipation notes. Uh, board, uh, we talked about this during the uh, budget process. Um, let me tell you this, I, I need you to approve this, but we do not want to do it, all right? When, uh, when, we, when you agreed to and offered up at least $10 million, well, excuse me, a maximum of $10 million of our fund balance to cover the, uh, 
the uh, loss of uh, of loss of the recapture uh, payment that we were going to have to make. Uh, David did a good job explaining to you that this was going to put in a strain on our monthly um, our monthly uh, fund balance that we use to run through to, to pay bills to, to pay everything in the district, especially during these months October, November, December, when we do not get a lot of tax money in. This will authorize us, if need be, to get a loan of up to $20 million if we need it to make sure that we can meet the, the, the needs. Uh, David has done his forecast. I, I don't think we are going to need them, but this does provide a safety net if, if we do. Board, I would recommend approval. Yeah, if, if we have to use it. Um, typically, you'll go out and find a, an insurance carrier like Fidelity and see what it is. I think uh, Fidelity is one of the biggest purchasers with uh, the tax and revenue that they're supposed to make. But uh, they could also be local representatives. And so what we'll be in the process of doing is going out and getting bids for uh, who we want to purchase this type of thing. We need a motion, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to approve a resolution authorizing a tax and revenue anticipata anticipation. Note. Motion by Mr. Hernandez, seconded by Mr. Isaacs. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. <laughs> Passes unanimously. Thank you, board. Hazardous bus routes. The uh, board, uh, Willie's uh, e uh, memo to you is on page 202. Um, Willie has done a phenomenal, Willie and his staff have done a phenomenal job, uh, did not have an easy task at all with the, with the, uh, rezoning of all of our elementary schools, with the increased, uh, uh, student, uh, student enrollments, um, especially with our lack of drivers and the, the budgetary issues that we're dealing with, we've really had to stick to that two mile legal limit around our legis, uh, around our campuses that the uh, legislature permits. Uh, however, as Willie always does, he has identified the, what we call the uh, hazardous uh, route plans for this school year, meaning he has already made a lot of changes within his plan to pick up kids, even if they're within two miles of their campuses, if we feel that those uh, routes are not safe for kids to be able to walk to school. Willie has already made provisions to pick those kids up. What this plan does for us, <laughs> this actually is submitted to TEA and we can get, gain funding as, as because you've designated these routes as hazardous route uh, of in the residence uh, route plan to be able to pick up some extra funding to, to be able to do that. I would recommend approval. So those areas, another thing that determined the factor was also to the number of students who would be walking in that area. Right. So it makes it less hazardous. Right. So it didn't it'd, qualify. It would be a yeah. courtesy route instead of a hazard route. <laughs> well, I have to say thanks to the city. When they did respond all over there, they, were, they had something out there the next day temporarily. They, they did. The other thing is, i got to say to the public who, well, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what you do for fun, but you juggle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and with Thank with not enough people. Thank you, guys. <laughs> we appreciate it. Yep.
there, there's a perception in the, in the, for the rest of us that Willie dyes his hair religiously <laughs> because he, 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 should ha he should have gray hair by now. <laughs> you, <laughs> you missed your calling. You should have been a professional air traffic controller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please approve, board. Uh, uh, approving the hazardous bus routes. Uh, the motion by Mr. Isaac, seconded by Mr. Bishop. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. Personnel appointments. Board page 204 are your recommendations for this uh, for this month. Uh, Woodrow and the team are doing an amazing job. Uh, Mr. Zachary is actually feeling much better from his surgery last week, so he should be back on his feet, uh, thing. but uh, the crew is taking care of business there. We appreciate their efforts. I would recommend approval of the professional contract subject to assignment. It looks like they, looks like they spent a lot of time in El Paso. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? Uh, Mr. Uh, I believe, how, how many are we down now? Is 50? 50. Yeah. Hmm. It was 59, so we're great attitude, uh, Patrick. <laughs> um, motion by Mr. Hernandez to approve. Is there a second? second? Second by Mr. Bishop. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. <coughs> Passes Thanks unanimously. Board. Yeah, there's there's several that retired. I noticed them. Okay, but okay, and the last the teacher contract abandonment. Board, I would recommend that you find a teacher contract abandonment. Uh, no good cause. That, that a good cause did not exist for resignation, and a complaint will be and request will be reported to DEA for A. Dennis. Um, a. Dennis by Mr. Isaac, second by Mr. Fuller. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. A and one it for passed Dee unanimously. Dee Dee Second. Um, motion by Mr. Isaac, seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries unanimously. Very good. And now we will go into executive session pursuant Texas Government Code 551.072 and 551.074. At what time? At 722. Good job. <laughs> 